I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Rick Rule, proprietor at Rule Investment Media, as well as an investor and speculator. Thank you so much for being here online with me once again today. Charlotte, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, well, of course, we're at the end of the year, and it's a great time to check in with you about what's going on in the markets. Uh, we're going to start off with gold. And, you know, when I was getting ready for this interview, I looked back at our conversation that we did almost exactly a year ago, uh, just over a year ago. And you had some encouraging words for people who were concerned at that time that gold had declined after hitting its all-time high. So we're at the end of another year where gold has been a disappointment for some market participants. And I wondered how you're feeling about it. Would you still characterize this as a cyclical decline in a secular bull market? I absolutely would. Uh, and I would also caution some of your listeners to be careful what they wish for. The set of circumstances that offer sharply higher gold prices is almost always difficult for the rest of your portfolio. People need to understand that more than anything else, gold is insurance. Uh, it's insurance against political and social turmoil. The gold price does well when people's faith in the system, and particularly faith in the purchasing power of their other investments, is challenged. So a circumstance that sees higher gold prices, which unfortunately I think we're going to see, is one where the rest of your portfolio is challenged. I would tell people too, I've been in the gold market now for almost 50 years, and what you see about gold is it can do nothing for you for long periods of time. And then it does spectacular things for you <laughs> over fairly short periods of time. And so really, in order to invest in gold or speculate in gold stocks, what you need to do is um, decide, first of all, the paradigm, the reason that you're going to do, the, do it. If you have a reason to do something, it usually allows you to have the psychological strength to stand the volatility inherent in gold stocks and to weather downturns well. I'm attracted to both gold as an investment and gold stocks as investments and speculations uh, that I am actively hoping, despite the fact that I own a lot of them, they go lower in price because I'd like to buy more. Uh, it's interesting, Charlotte, the way that we uh, buy financial goods and the way we buy physical goods is very different. If because Vancouver is cold and wet right now, you decided that you wanted a better coat and you went down to Pacific Center, you wouldn't be happy to see all those coats marked up. You'd be looking for one on sale. But surprisingly, when we buy financial assets, we seem to want them to be more expensive rather than cheaper. If I've learned nothing else in 45 years of investment and speculation, it's that if there is a good that I want, I want it to be on sale. And I would argue with you that gold is fairly priced now, and many of the gold stocks are flat out cheap, which is to say they're good. Okay, yeah, we've got a couple of things that I will probably take you back to there. But I want to go into what you said about gold balancing out other aspects of your portfolio. I know that we love to focus on gold and the precious metals here, but do you think that in some cases people are too focused on the precious metals element of their portfolios? Very often, when people adopt the precious metals narrative, they go in more heavily than they can afford either psychologically or financially. The good news about gold is during periods of time when there's a market when there's market turmoil, if you regard it as insurance, a little bit goes a long way. I came into financial markets in 1970, and over the next decade, the gold price advanced from $35 an ounce to $850 an ounce. You didn't need much gold in your portfolio to provide a hedge over your general market securities or other asset classes. Moving forward, uh, in 2000, the price of gold was 253, I think it was. Uh, it peaked 10 years later at 1900. That teaches us several things. Uh, gold bull markets are uh, much longer affairs than people think they are, and their dimension is much greater. Uh, when the gold price finally goes, it goes a lot, not a little. But it can take a long time to reward you. And the volatility within those bull markets, uh, as you had described it, the secular decline, secular decline, pardon me, cyclical declines in secular bull markets can be absolutely dramatic. It's important if you're going to be in gold to think about what function you want it to fulfill. In other words, is it a purely insurance function? 
which means that you can accomplish it uh, with the bullion. Uh, you don't take the need, need to take the risks and the equities. If you want to amplify the gain that you would enjoy in the bullion, but you're willing to do some work and take some risk, then you look at the equities. But the most important thing for a gold investor to do is to invest in himself or herself, to understand the reasons for their motivations, to develop a plan, develop the discipline and implement that plan, to decide, first of all, whether gold is right for them, and if so, in what form and in what proportion. Yeah, of course, it's good to, to know why you're doing what you've decided to do. And in the past, you've given us a pretty clear idea of why you think the gold price is going to increase and what factors you think are driving it. I wondered if you could review those for us and maybe add any additional insight that you've had since the last time we spoke. Yeah, I'd be delighted. Uh, as I say, I'm, I'm thinking, sadly, that the gold price is going to go up, which means that we're going to have some challenges elsewhere, elsewhere in our portfolios and the economy. And let's review the reasons for that. Remember that uh, early in this discussion, we said that uh, gold can move for many reasons, but the primary reason is because people are concerned about the savings value, uh, the purchasing power, pardon me, of their savings or other investment assets. And let's think uh, about why those concerns might be in order today. I know that we're talking to a primarily Canadian audience, but I'm going to give you American examples because I'm American and I think in American dollars. So the first thing that causes me as a saver and investor concern uh, about the maintenance of purchasing power in my US dollar denominated investments and savings is quantitative easing. Uh, quantitative easing is a very, very, very fancy name for counterfeiting. 40% of all the US dollars ever in existence have come into existence in the last two years. Uh, the American economy has grown by 40% in the last two years. The government has printed, or with a keystroke, keystroke caused to occur, 40% more supply of U.S. dollars secured around an economy that hasn't grown by 40%, which is to say it has been counterfeited. And that causes me concern. What causes me more concern, and ought to cause you more concern yet, is debt and deficits. Uh, in the U.S., and by the way, the per capita Canadian numbers are worse. In the U.S., the aggregate federal debt on balance sheet is $29 trillion. Net debt is $22 trillion. Your listeners should review the fact that a trillion has 12 zeros. It's a very, very large number. The off-balance sheet liabilities are even more daunting. Off-balance sheet liabilities are things like Medicare, Medicaid, uh, various transfer payments, promises that we've made to each other, the net present value of those obligations exceeds $120 trillion. So at the federal level, not including state and local debts, nor unfunded pension plans, uh, our obligations exceed $140 trillion. And we, prepare, we propose to service and extinguish these debts with a budget that's in deficit by $4 trillion a year, which is to say, rather than dig ourselves out of the hole, we're digging ourselves deeper. Now, this is of particular concern to younger investors like yourself. What debt really is, is the manifestation of the fact that my generation has made ourselves all kinds of generous promises, and we're leaving you the bill. It's an, international, it's an intergenerational transfer of wealth from you to me. I thank you for it, but you should be unhappy about that. Both of us need to be concerned about the impact of debt and deficits on the purchasing power of our savings in fiat currency denominated instruments. But uh, Charlotte, sadly, it gets worse. Negative real interest rates. Uh, this is not a force of nature. You would not willingly uh, forego consumption today on money that you earn being a broadcaster and pay me to take it so that I can consume now and pay you back later. That's what negative real interest rates are. Let's look at the arithmetic. The US 10-year treasury, which is the benchmark security in the world, the one against other securities, one, uh, which other securities are valued against, right now pays investors about 1.5%, 150 basis points. In a currency that the Congressional Budget Office suggests is depreciating by 6.5% a year. In other words, the US government says, if you give them money today, they will give you back less. 10 years from now, the first promise in my life that they're certain to keep. Think about the value proposition 
of losing 5% a year in purchasing power, guaranteed. Jim Grant calls this return-free risk. <laughs> Franz Pick called it a certificate of guaranteed confiscation. But if anything ought to, ought to make you concerned about the purchasing power of your savings, it ought to be a government guarantee that your savings are going to deteriorate investing in those instruments. The fourth thing, uh, uh, that I think you need to look at is simply the fact that gold and silver, despite their uh, historic utility in times like this, are disliked and in fact underowned. It is estimated that the current market share of precious metals and precious metals related investments in the total savings and investment market in the US is about one half of 1%. The three decade mean is one and a half percent. So if quantitative easing, debt and deficits and negative real interest rates had any impact on the psyche of the average investor, all precious metals investments would have to do is not outperform other investments, but merely return to mean, which is what I think is going to happen. If they return to mean, demand for this asset class would triple. And that's precisely what I think is going to happen. The consequence of that is that although I own a fair amount of gold and silver, and I own a fair amount of precious metals equities, and I'm the largest shareholder of Sprott, so you could argue that my financial future is geared to gold and silver, uh, I want more. Uh, and the fact that they are, from my point of view, attractively priced is useful to me, because I believe that those four factors will over time, and I can't say it's going to be in 2022, I don't know. But I think it's much more likely than not that there's a probability that precious metals don't only go higher, that they go much higher. And one other thing, Charlotte, when people are concerned about time, what I've learned after investing for 45 or 50 years is that if I ask myself a question where the answer begins with when, not if, I'm asking myself a high quality question. People seem to be very willing to speculate in the, lat in the next crypto coin that they can't pronounce. Uh, and the question that they're asking is if this utility will gain widespread acceptance. They have no idea really as to the utility or the probability, uh, but they're willing to ask themselves an if question. I prefer to ask myself where the question, at least by way of probability, begins with when, not if. In other words, I'd rather be right three years from now than be wrong tomorrow. Yeah, so you've laid it out very clearly here, and those are those are definitely some great points. I get the sense that something people struggle with is keeping both those long-term arguments in mind, as well as dealing with the day-to-day, -day. like right now, everybody is so focused on the Fed. What is the Fed going to do? What are they going to say? Interest rates, inflation, tapering, all of those things in the mix. So do you have any advice on sorting out those things? Well, I, I think you look at what the Fed has to do and what the impact of that will be over time. It seems to me that the Fed would like to let interest rates rise a little bit. They'd like to do it so that they have a tool uh, where they can lower them if they need to again, but it's tough to lower them below zero. It's also tough to let them rise. Uh, I, I know that most audiences prefer narrative to arithmetic, but I'm going to give them some arithmetic anyway. If, uh, as is true, the U.S. 10-year Treasury yields 1.5%, if you go back over the last 40 years, traditionally, the U.S. 10-year Treasury has had a positive yield over the rate of inflation. If the rate of inflation is 6.5%, then if the Treasury yield was to revert to mean, uh, the U.S. 10-year Treasury would be selling with a 7 handle or a 7.5 handle which means that the debt service cost throughout society, but particularly to the government, would go up fourfold. <laughs> I don't think they can do it. But again, it gets worse. Traditionally, the 30-year mortgage rate in the US, the rate that American homeowners pay to borrow money to buy a house, trades at a premium to the US 10-year treasury. If the US 10-year treasury rate was at seven, the first mortgage rate would be at, at uh, what, uh, eight, eight and a quarter, as opposed to three. Uh, that would give you affordable housing the old fashioned way, which is to say that the price or the affordability of houses would fall so much as a consequence of interest rates that the real estate market would get crushed. Am I saying this is going to happen? No. 
what I'm saying is that it is unlikely that the Fed is going to be able to let interest rates rise to any substantial degree, which means that the set of circumstances that's in front of us, unfortunately, probably, favors gold for a fairly substantial period of time. Do I know what's going to happen a month from now? No. Do I know what's going to happen three months from now? No. Do I know a set of circumstances that's very much more likely to occur than not occur? Yes. And am I able, as a consequence of looking at the probabilities around what has to happen, uh, fashion a response in my portfolio that will much more likely than not reward me over time? Yes. Uh, I prefer probabilities or certainties over longer periods of time uh, rather than psychologically secure <laughs> improbable outcomes during shorter periods of time. And I would urge your listeners to begin to view life in the same fashion. Okay. Let's look at the precious metals bull market as a whole. One thing that I've heard you beginning to talk about in some of your other interviews is how the first half of a precious metals bull market is usually all about gold. The second half tends to favor silver more. So I wondered if you could give us a sense of where we are right now and also maybe give us some historical examples so we can understand what you mean by that. Some of this now is going to become conjecture, Charlotte. Um but a lot of life is about conjecture. I've lived through two precious metals bull markets in my life, 1970 to 1981 and 2000 to 2011. Both of those were decade long affairs. In fact, 11 year long affairs. Uh, I believe that the bull market that we're in now probably got underway in 2018. So we're three years into a bull market. Uh, I suggest that if past is prologue, doesn't need to be, but if past is prologue, there's probably seven years to go. So we're probably still in the first half of the bull market. And we talked about before, bull markets have substantial dimension. The gold price now has gone from what? 1,000 to 1,800 US, something like that. And people say, well, isn't the bull market over? I mean, gold's up 40%. Well, first bull market, gold was up 25 fold. <laughs> <laughs> Second bull market, gold was up sixfold. Am I saying that gold is going to be up three or fourfold? No, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was. Uh, as we talk to examining prior bull markets, there is this incredible volatility, these incredible cyclical declines in secular markets, which is precisely what I think we're involved in. I went through uh, one of these in 1975, where the market the gold market fell by half. <laughs> I went through another one in uh, what, 2002, where the market fell by 20 or 30%. So uh, this is not unheralded to me. The other things I've learned about uh, gold, oh, precious metals bull market, and getting back to your question, is that normally bull markets are brought on by fear buyers. Uh, and the fear buyers go to insurance, they go to gold. Once gold has established the momentum and the narrative around precious metals becomes more, uh, understood and accepted by the market uh, and the investors and speculators come into the market, which is to say the greed buyers keep the fear buyers company, then the metal with more volatility uh, and lower value per unit of exchange, silver begins to take over. Uh, the second half of the two bull markets that I have, that I have been through have been silver centric. And I would say to the speculators, who I suspect are an important part of your audience, that the most upside volatility that you see in precious metals markets are in reasonably high quality silver equities. The market capitalization around the silver equities is so small that when the narrative begins to appeal to the generalist investor and money flows from the generalist investor into the silver equities, there simply isn't enough market cap in that silo to handle the money. I'm reminded early in my career of things like uh, Silver Standard, which we underwrote at 76 cents, going to $45. Uh, Pan American Silver, which I, if I remember correctly, uh, we underwrote at 50 cents, going to $40. <laughs> the bull market before that in the 70s, Coeur d'Alene going from a penny dreadful in Spokane at 10 cents to $65. The upside in 
reasonable quality silver stocks in a silver bull market is truly insane. Um, unlike anything that, well, I, I guess I've seen it in other instruments like uranium stocks and in crypto. In the uranium stocks, I understood it. In crypto, I don't. But I can say among the classes of investment and speculation uh, revolving around precious metals, that for speculators, uh, the silver stocks have incredible upside. I've been talking to them a bit because part of my audience is attracted to me because of the call I made on uranium a couple of years ago. It's interesting that when you and I were talking about uranium, as I say, three years ago, nobody cared. And now everybody's fascinated. And what I want to say to speculators is, yes, there's more room to go in uranium, but the market's affinity for silver now is where the market's affinity was for uranium two and a half years ago. Uh, to be a successful speculator, you got to hit them where they ain't. Uh, you got to buy assets that are unloved. You can't get an asset that's loved cheap. And so in terms of sentiment, silver is where uranium was. Right. And, you know, silver has, I find, a really dedicated base, but also a group of people who have faced so much pain. And we had that hope at the beginning of the year with the silver squeeze that's kind of dwindled off. For you, would you say that's kind of still going on? It's just the beginning and, and we'll see it rise again? I think we will see the real silver squeeze in front of us. The silver squeeze that we saw was very interesting. And I got to say, I was taken by surprise by the amount of physical silver that was bought by newcomers to the silver market. Uh, it was incredible to see the amount of silver that they bought. But that isn't what the real silver squeeze is about. The, the real silver squeeze is simply about the market share of precious metals returning to their historic means. It's about university pension funds, uh, state pension funds, and insurance companies uh, going from having no precious metals in their asset boards to having two or three percent uh, in precious metals. When that happens, Charlotte, and I really think it's when, not if, uh, when demand for precious metals merely returns to the prior means, uh, I think then you see demand for precious metals triple. We may have seen as a consequence of the silver squeeze, uh, a, a 10 or 12% increase in demand for silver in the United States, you know, relative to supply on float. I think we're going to see demand triple. Uh, that's 300%, not 10%. And when you have a 300% increase in demand, with no concomitant increase in supply, because you can't increase supply that much, uh, the price action can be very, very dramatic. So I think that the silver squeeze that we saw was an interesting phenomenon. It tells us that the way the world invests and speculates is changing. That information doesn't need to come from Chase Bank or the Wall Street Journal. It can come from Charlotte and the Cloud. There's distributed information and distributed response. That was the message of the silver squeeze. But in terms of its impact on the silver market, there wasn't much. What will make a difference in the impact on the silver market is when we get away from the Reddit crowd and we go to uh, you know, Ontario municipal employees, <laughs> uh, you know, TIA, CREF, the biggest institutional investors in the world, when they begin to return to precious metals markets, as they had to do as responsible investors in the latter part of the 70s, I think then you see the real silver squeeze. Okay. All right. Certainly that sounds exciting. Let's now move over to uranium, which is another market of a lot of interest to our audience here. Maybe we can pick up on some of the things that you were saying as we talked about silver. What are the lessons that we can learn from uranium so far, how we've seen the market move? Maybe there's a, there's a contrarian takeaway here that investors shouldn't forget. There's absolutely a message there. When you and I were talking about it three years ago, when it had to go up, when it had to go up, Nobody cared. 
because people didn't have the psychological verification of an increasing market. They didn't have the courage of their convictions. You and I talked, Charlotte, about the fact that silver was priced at, pardon me, uranium was priced at $20 a pound, and that the total cost of production worldwide was between $50 and $60 a pound, meaning either that the price of uranium had to go up to a level at which the industry earned its cost of capital, or the reactors would shut down and the lights would go out. Those were the two choices. What was most likely? Well, pretty obviously, the lights would stay on, the price would go up, and that's what happened. When the narrative became substantiated by price action, uh, as the sector became less attractive because it became more attractive, ironically, it attracted more people. People were more willing to buy uranium stocks after the prices had risen fourfold than they were before the, the prices had risen fourfold. I'm in an interesting place for, with uranium here. Uh, having been early, I've been a reasonably good seller of the juniors. Uh, it seems to me that most, if you took the junior uranium stocks as a basket, that on an economic point of view, a non-narrative point of view, they're discounting $60 uranium in a $45 world, which is to say they're ahead of themselves. At the same time, I believe that the uranium price now over the next two or three years, I can't tell you when, escalates from its current $45 a pound to $70 or $75 a pound because the cost of producing uranium is increasing with inflation and with permitting difficulties. So over two or three years, I think as an example, this sounds like a commercial, it probably is. If you bought the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust today at $45 a pound, in three years from now, it's likely selling at 70 or 75, maybe more. A pretty good, you know, pretty attractive rate of return for something that uh, is much more likely than not to happen. I think the biggest and finest uranium stocks in the world uh, probably double, maybe triple. I think the outlook for the juniors is more mixed. Uh, our database has 69 uranium companies in it now. Most of them, unfortunately, don't have any uranium. They're looking for some. And if the price of something that you don't have any of goes up, <laughs> one wonders why that might affect your fortunes. So. You need to be picky in the uranium stocks, and it wouldn't surprise me to see the juniors decline a little bit in price, as in fact they've been doing after the last 45 days. I think the whole sector trades higher. Uh, I think if people are willing to buy the stocks selectively now, two years from now, two and a half years from now, those are the time frames I think in, they'll probably be very happy. But most speculators think in two or three month time frames, uh, and those people I think are bound to be disappointed. So uranium would be very, very, very good to me, as it has been over the next two or three years. It will be somewhat less good to people who don't have the courage of their convictions and don't have the psychological and financial staying power to handle the perturbations. The lesson is, if you're going to invest in cyclical industries, you have to be a contrarian. And to be a contrarian, you have to look for things that are out of favor and unloved and have to go up. And you have to be willing to do it without the psychological reinforcement of rising prices. What you need to do is buy something when everybody hates it and you feel bad about it and sell something when everybody loves it and you feel good about it. And it's very tough to do if you aren't 68 years of age. Right. Yeah. You, you always usually give us an example of unloved markets that you're keeping an eye on. And in the past, obviously, we've talked about uranium. In more recent times, we've covered oil and gas as well as something you're interested in. So is that something that you're still looking at? Can we get an update on what's happening there? Yeah, I am. Uh, it's particularly timely now because the uh, you know Omicron variant of COVID is causing many investors to think, that the airlines are going to shut down and the travel is going to shut down, demand for oil is going to decline and the oil price is going to decline. At the same time that younger uh, investors in particular are concerned about the impact of COVID promises by society on oil demand. And generally the fact that opinion leaders among young investors, you know, that noted physicist Greta Thornburg uh, as an example, uh, oil is decidedly out of favor. Uh, which of course means I like it. Trudeau hates it. That means I like it. Freeland hates it. That means I like it. Uh, Horgan uh, hates it. That means I like it. 
Let's look at the economics and physics uh, around oil and gas. The International Energy Agency suggests that the oil industry needs 60 US dollars as an incentive price to continue to produce it. Right now, with the price at sort of 70 US, we're in pretty good shape. But a year ago, when the price of oil was at uh, 30 or 40 dollars, it had to go up. It simply had to go up or your car wouldn't start unless you are one of those very few people who drive a Tesla. So a, a circumstance where the price of something has to go up and where the indi industry is already horrendously profitable uh, seems to me to be a good investment. It, uh, the way we run the economics on uh, the oil companies they are priced on the cash flow that they would generate at about $45. So we have a situation where these companies are selling oil for 70. They are priced as though oil were selling at 45. <laughs> and the circumstances are in place that I think continue to guarantee higher prices for oil because the oil industry as a whole is deferring sustaining capital and new project investments which continues to impair their ability to produce oil, which reduces supply. In addition, there are government constraints. The United States, for whatever reason, has decided not to approve the Keystone Pipeline. I guess we don't want Canadian crude. Instead, we take Saudi crude and Nigerian crude. And in Eastern Canada, they won't, appear, they won't approve the Trans-Canada Pipeline. I guess uh, in Quebec and the Maritimes that Saudi crude, uh, Venezuelan crude, Mexican crude, and Nigerian crude generates less carbon than Canadian crude. Uh, the point is that there are all these constraints on supply, but demand continues despite the narrative to increase. If you have a circumstance where the oil price has to continue higher, and the industry is priced as though the oil price was going to go lower, you have an opportunity, particularly, I think, in the Canadian oils. I think Canadian oil and gas investors listen to too much to their prime minister and to their finance minister, uh, and they don't pay attention to the fact that Canada has a wonderful human endowment and a wonderful resource endowment around oil and gas. I think investors don't pay attention to the fact that the Canadian oil and gas industry at US $60 a barrel oil uh, or at $3 Canadian ACO uh, generates such spectacular free cash flow that the best quartile of Canadian companies can fund all of their sustaining capital investments and still pay handsome dividends. <laughs> I'm frankly delighted that this circumstance exists. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to buy high quality companies with high quality reserves that are prudently managed, that will continue to generate lots of free cash in the future, but can pay me very handsome dividends today. The idea that I can get a five or 6% yield on a high quality Canadian oil company when I get 30 basis points or 40 basis points or 50 basis points in the bank uh, is just superbly attractive to me. Okay, so that gives us a good look at what's going on in oil and gas. I wondered if we could take a look at kind of the energy space as a whole, because we have these interesting circumstances going on. You mentioned uranium prices have to rise or the lights go out, oil and gas prices need to go out, up or your car won't start. Meanwhile, we've got this global shift toward green energy, or at least we're trying to do that around the world. So how do all those factors fit together for you? You know, Charlotte, uh, we're going to need more solar energy and we're going to need more wind and we're going to need more ge geothermal and we're going to need more hydro and we're going to need more, con more uh, conservation and we're gonna need more uranium. <laughs> what many of us don't recognize is 1.2 billion people on earth, Charlotte, have no access to electricity at all. They wanna live like you do. They want the backdrop of their apartment to look like the backdrop of your apartment. But another 2 billion people on earth live in energy poverty, which means they have access to intermittent energy or energy which is to them unaffordable. We've made tremendous strides 
uh, as a species, humankind, in the last 30 years, making the poorest of the poor less poor. And as we continue to do that, which I believe we will, the energy demands of those people will continue to escalate. They want to live like you and I. There's nothing particularly attractive about a mud hut with no light bulbs and no refrigeration. If you live on the equator, uh, no air conditioning. They, uh, as they proceed, their transportation goes from bare feet to sneakers, from sneakers to a bicycle, from a bicycle to a 50cc motorcycle, and from a 50cc motorcycle to a, to, to a Toyota Hilux. They're a long way from a Tesla. So there is a demand throughout the poorest of the poor for more electricity and more transportation. At the same time that people who have already achieved the lifestyle that's exemplified by the background behind your face, uh, all of us want to use more energy too. And so there will be continued demands for all forms of energy. The attraction that we feel towards alternative energy needs to be tempered with the fact that it needs to be affordable, and it needs to be reliable. I mean, we see these idiotic political responses where Germany is an example where the sun doesn't shine, is trying to rely on solar power. Uh, that's a bad, you know, it's a bad strategy at night where the sun doesn't shine anywhere, but it's a bad strategy in the northern reaches of the northern hemisphere anyway. When the Germans shut down their nuclear fleet, what happened is, first of all, that their power bills went up to the extent that it became a real problem for the poorer members of society, at the same time that the Germans had to quadruple or quintuple <laughs> their burning of coal, which means that they blew out their Kyoto Protocol pledges. And so these circumstances are gonna apply across society. Uh, that isn't to say that I believe that we should be loading the atmosphere with incredible amounts of carbon or other forms of pollution. What I'm trying to say is that our demand for all forms of energy, not just yours and mine, which are increasing rapidly, but more particularly the poorest half of humankind are going to continue to increase over the next 30 years. And we have no choice but to optimize in every way we can and increase the utilization of every form of affordable energy. Okay, as we get closer to the end here, I wonder if you look forward to 2022 at the resource space as a whole, are there any themes that you are expecting to see develop? I think at some point in time, the, the most easily identifiable trend, maybe it's 22, maybe it's 19, maybe it's 2022, maybe it's 2023, will be a resumption of a precious metals bull market in earnest, both for the physicals and for the equities. Uh, I think that that is inevitable, even if it isn't eminent. So I am attracted to that. I think also that yield oriented investors, not speculators, but yield oriented investors will be drawn increasingly to the oil and gas business. Uh, and surprisingly, I, th I think that some yield investors will be uh, attracted to other materials too. You look at the dividend yields uh, available in companies like uh, Nutrien, like BHP, like Rio Tinto. The fact that there are sustainable five and six and 7% yields uh, in a world where competing investment instruments yield much less. I mean, the junk bond index in the U.S. yields 4.6 or 4.7. Uh, yes, it's a debt instrument, so in some sense it's safer. But the yields that we're seeing across the resource complex are extremely competitive relative to other yields uh, that are being offered. And I think that'll become increasingly attractive to people. So I expect a good, if not great, year next year. For your listeners who are accredited, the uh, Canadian microcap space, many of these people have played chicken with capital markets. They've chosen not to raise money in 2021 because they saw their market caps fall. And I think they're going to have to raise money in 2022. And if the market in the first half of 2022, the, over market, the overall market isn't good, the terms on these private placements we could very easily be as good as the private placement terms that were offered in 2019, which was an epic year. So people who have people who are accredited investors who have the ability to speculate in private placements may very well have a spectacular year in 2022. 
All right. And as we wrap up, my last question and my favorite one to ask at this time of year is what's your best advice for investors as we head into the new year? Invest in yourself. Uh, understand why you are doing what you're doing. Invest in your education. That means listening to Charlotte in the cloud. It means listening to a lot of people. But it means when you listen, that you need to think. Uh, a special invitation to your listeners with regards to that. If your listeners care what I think about their natural resources investments, I'm happy to help them. Uh, if any of your listeners go to a website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com, and list your natural resource stocks. Sidebar, please no crypto, please no pot stocks, please no tech stocks. Confine me to what I do best. I will rank your portfolio one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. And if you care, uh, I will send your listeners for free uh, the Barron's Gold Mining Index, which is the best pictorial representation of precious metals, equities, bull markets I've seen. I'll send to a hundred year commodity chart that talks about how other commodities, the stuff of mankind, uh, how cheap or expensive it is relative to other asset classes going back a uh, hundred years. Uh, and if people care, if they mention private placements, uh, I'll develop for those of your uh, listeners who are accredited a lot more on my theme around private placements. So I'm willing to do any of that. The site that you go to is ruleinvestmentmedia.com. Great. Well, thank you so much for that offer. We'll, we'll leave the link in the description below so people will have it. And thank you as well for coming on to talk and sum up the year and what's going to go on next year. A pleasure, Charlotte. Thank you for having me back. Of course. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Rick Rule.